Good morning, everybody. We are in uh, Mark chapter 9 this week. Been, we got a lot of new people here. So if you're not up to speed, you're more than welcome to read along with us now. There are multiple playlists at this channel, including Old Testament from Genesis 1 and New Testament from Matthew 1, working our way forward in both books. So I'm very, very happy to have you here. However, if you would like some more context, please feel free to go back in those playlists and start at the beginning and then catch up with us. We do one Old Testament video per week, which drops Friday evening. And then we do one New Testament reading per week, which drops Sunday morning. And again, um, if you would like some more background on what I believe and why, go to the YouTube search bar and put in Bear Independent Testimony. And there's a three-part video there that will give you the backstory that uh, you need to understand how I came to the structure of belief that I have today. Okay, so in the end of Mark 8, Messiah is um, addressing a crowd as usual. And um, he says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinning generation of him, the son of Adam, also shall be ashamed when he comes in the esteem of his father with the set apart messengers at the end of an age. And then he says here um, in the beginning of nine, and he said to them, truly I say to you that there are some standing here who shall not taste of death at all until they see the reign of Elohim having come in power. Now, Mark 9, 1 I think that that should have been the end of chapter 8. And 9 should have started at verse 2. Now, the thing is, you know, back in the day when these were written, they didn't have chapter and verse. That's not how this stuff worked. They just, these were kind of long flowing narratives. And then they've been broken up over the years. And different Bibles do actually have, um, if you go back far enough, they're broken up in different places. So, anyway, because I believe that 9 1 has a lot more to do with verse 8 than it does, or with chapter 8, than it does with what's going to continue to happen here in chapter 9. But I'm wondering because what he says here is. Truly I say to you that there are some standing here who shall not taste of death at all until they see the reign of Elohim having come in power. And the standard Christian interpretation there is one of everlasting life. But that's not what it says. It says that there's people here that are not going to die until the Father comes. The return of Messiah, right? He, all right, so if we go back a little bit further, and turning around, this is 8.33, and seeing his taught ones, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for your thoughts are not those of Elohim, but those of men. And calling near the crowd with his taught ones, he said, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his stake, bear your cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for the sake of me and the good news, he shall save it. For what shall it profit, profit a man, excuse me, if he gains all the world and loses his own life? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinning generation, of him the Son of Man shall also be ashamed when he comes into the esteem of his Father and his set-apart messengers. This adulterous and sinning generation has been brought up several times by Messiah, and we should have a note in our Bibles that would be 
Numbers. Numbers 14, question mark. This is 15. Yeah. Numbers 14. Um, 21 ish. Yep. Fourteen twenty one ish. Numbers fourteen twenty one. The Hebrews Israelites that rejected the promised land. Okay. Now I believe, I don't know, but I believe, and I'm I realize I'm dancing around a few things here, and then we're gonna get started in nine. There are some standing here that are not going to taste death until the kingdom of heaven, the reign of Elohim, has come in its power. I think there were spirits or demons amongst them that Yeshua is addressing. Hey, look, man, there's, there's things here that are not going to be dead until the Father comes for once and for all. And I believe that that has more, and I could be wrong, and I'm willing to be wrong, but I don't think that verse is about eternal life. I think it's talking about a time when death will come for some of these things, referring back to the end of chapter 8. This wicked and adulterous generation and get behind me, Satan, and this crowd and the things that are in it. Um, so, okay. Understanding that, the beginning of chapter 9, Mark 9, we'll go to verse 2. Coffee's tremendous. Bless you, brother. And after six days, Yeshua took Kepha, Peter, and Jacob, and John, Yachob, and Yohanan, and led them up on a high mountain alone by themselves. And Yeshua was transformed before them. And his garments became glittering, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth is able to whiten. And there appeared to them Eliyahu, Elijah, and Moshe, Moses, and they were talking with Yeshua. And Peter responded and said to Yeshua, Rabbi, is it good for us to be here? And let us make three booths, one for you and one for Moshe and one for Eliyahu. Because he did not know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. And there came a cloud overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, the beloved, hear him. And there came a cloud. If you've been reading along with us in the Old Testament, um, you would remember that the esteem of Yahweh, the glory of the Lord comes in a cloud, right? And that they would only move the tabernacle when they followed the cloud. Wherever the cloud dwelt, that's where they would move the tabernacle, right? And this is not the first time you know, when Messiah was baptized by John the Baptist, the spirit descended like a dove out of the clouds, right? And the sky opened out of the clouds and came a voice who said, this is my, my son, my beloved, in whom I am delighted. Awesome, right? And so this is Yahweh. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, the beloved, hear him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but only Yeshua. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he ordered them not to relate to anyone what they saw till the son of Adam had risen from the dead. And they kept this matter to themselves, debating what the rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah has to come first? Because there is a, in multiple traditions and religions that revere the Hebrew texts, which is a lot. Um, obviously, Judaism, Christianity, Islam to a degree, and Mormonism, 
uh, the Baha'i faith even has a tradition of Elijah. There's a lot of them. And then myriad offshoots. Elijah. Elijah was the prophet, right? I think the two witnesses in Revelation when they return will be Elijah and Moshe. Because you need the prophet to herald in the coming of Messiah, scripturally speaking. And the second exodus, you're going to need a Moshe to move the Father's people from where they are to where they need to be. One massive bug out, basically. But I digress. Okay, so this tradition that Elijah would come before Messiah... Um, predated Yeshua, okay? And they asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah has, has to come first? And he said to them, Elijah indeed, having come first, restores all matters. And how has it been written concerning the son of Adam that he is to suffer much and be despised? But I say to you that even Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they wished, and it, and it has been written of him. And coming to the taught ones, he saw a large crowd around them and scribes disputing with them. And immediately when all the crowd saw him, they were greatly astonished and running near greeting him. So Messiah said, look, Elisha did come. And having come first, restores all matters. And now what has it been written, written concerning the son of Adam? That he is to suffer and be much despised. He's saying, look, Elijah came. Now I'm here. Okay. Um, and immediately when all the crowd saw him, they were greatly astonished and running near greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you disputing with them? And one of the crowd answering said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a dumb spirit. And whenever he seizes him, he throws him down and he foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and he wastes away. And I spoke to your taught ones, your disciples, that they should cast him out, but they were not able. And he answered him and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. So they brought him to Yeshua. And when he saw Yeshua, immediately the spirit threw him into convulsions. And falling on the ground, he rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And he asked the father, how long has he been like this? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. This spirit has pushed this person into the, into the water and the fire to destroy him. But if it is possible for you, have compassion on us and help us. And Yeshua said to him, if you are able to believe, all is possible to him who believes. And immediately, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, I believe, Master, help my unbelief. And when Yeshua saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the clean, unclean spirit, saying to him, You deaf and dumb spirit, I order you, come out of him and never again enter into him. And crying out and convulsing him much, it came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said that he was dead. So the spirit went out, and this guy's just laying lifeless. But Yeshua, taking him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he came into a house, his taught ones asked him separately, Why were we unable to cast him out? And he said to them, It is impossible for this kind to go out except through fasting and prayer. Prayer and fasting. All right, so let's examine a couple of things here. There was this powerful demon that had been with this person since birth, that Yeshua's apostles, his disciples, were unable to rebuke, to which Yeshua says, it is impossible for one like this to come out except through fasting and prayer. I want you to look at something. So, and then prior to that, we have Yeshua, and he's got with him Peter and Jacob, Jacob and 
Jonathan, or not Jonathan, Yohanan, John, and led them up on a high mountain alone by themselves. And he was transformed before them. And they say, oh, and then Elijah and Moses show up. They say, hey, should we make you three booths? One for you and one for Moshe and one for Eliyahu, Elijah. Booths, should we make you booths? People don't, people then didn't really live in booths. They lived in tents. Why would you need a booth? Let's go to Leviticus 2342. Leviticus 23, which is the quintessential chapter on feasts, verse 42. Dwell in booths for seven days. All you who are native born in Israel dwell in booths so that your generations know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Mitzrayim. I am Yahweh your Elohim. Thus did Moshe speak of the appointed times of Yahweh to the children of Israel. Dwell in booths. And in fact, we can go back to... Um, and we will... We can go back here to 34, 23, 34, speak to the children of Israel. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe. Who's Yeshua with? Elijah and Moshe. Okay. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel saying on the 15th day of the seventh new moon is the festival of Sukkot for seven days to Yahweh. On the first days of set apart gathering, you do no servile work. For seven days, you bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. On the eighth day, there shall be a set apart gathering. These are the appointed times, slaughtering drink offerings, Sabbaths, gifts, voluntary vows, offerings. Fifteenth day of the seven new moon, when you gather in the fruit of the land, celebrate the festival of Yahweh for seven days. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day fruit of good trees, branches of palms, twigs, leafy trees, and willows of the stream, and will rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim for seven days. Good morning, Ma. And you shall celebrate it as a festival to Yahweh for seven days in the year. A law forever, a law forever in your generations. Celebrate it in the seventh new moon. Dwell in booths for seven days. All you who are native born in Israel dwell in booths. Okay. So, let's look at it again here, just saying. And after six days, Yeshua took Kepha and Peter and Yaakov and Yohanan. Okay, cool. There's a reference to booths. Now, fasting and prayer. Let's go back to Leviticus 23, 26. Because what's before dwelling in booths? And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, On the tenth day of this seventh new moon is Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur. It shall be a set-apart gathering for you, and you shall afflict your beings, meaning you shall fast, and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. And you do no work on that same day, for it is Yom Kippurim, to make atonement for you before Yahweh your Elohim. For any being who is not afflicted, who is not fasting on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. And any being who does any work on that same day, that being I shall destroy from the midst of his people. You do no work, a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Okay, that's on the 10th day. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 10, 11, 12. Good morning, Ma. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Six days. Okay. So we have atonement and fasting on the 10th. And then we go over here and it says, And after six days, And after six days, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And over here, Leviticus 23, on the 15th day, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, and on the 15th day of the seventh new moon, 
you're gonna go dwell in booths because of Sukkot. I think that it was this time of year and that Yeshua and the apostles had observed the Day of Atonement and that they went and dwelled in booths. And during Sukkot, Moshe and Elijah, Eliyahu, show up and Yeshua is transfigured. He has his transformation. And then, and the spirit moves hardcore during feast times. Man, there's just power in the air. I think Yeshua continued to fast. And he was Yeshua. And this powerful demon that the rest of his his taught ones were unable to deal with. He showed up and nailed him as an example to say, ones like this don't go out but by power, but by fasting and prayer. Which, atonement, the day of atonement is fasting and prayer. Leviticus 23, 26. So I think contextually, based upon what's going on here, that this is what they were dealing with. And I just wanted to show you that. Um, because otherwise, I feel like it's kind of a throwaway line. Well, it's just fasting and prayer. Yes, and fasting and prayer are both excellent things. And boy, there's spiritual power in both of them. But fasting and prayer on the Day of Atonement leading up to Sukkot? Whole nother story. And so if we're talking about battling nations and principalities here, understand that like Sukkot is the... Man, it's like the finale, man. It's the final battle. It's like what it prophesies is the millennial kingdom when we dwell with Messiah forever. And here we have up on this mountain, we have Elijah and Moses, uh, who I believe are the two witnesses in the book of Revelation, and Messiah. Like if this isn't prophetic, what is? Right? <laughs> so... Anyway, and then he comes down and is like, oh, you had a demon your whole life. Nobody else can get him out. Boom, get out of there. Okay, sorry. Okay. 28, Mark 9, 28. And when he came into a house, his taught ones asked him separately, why were we unable to cast him out? And he said to them, it is impossible for this kind to come out except through prayer and fasting. And going from there, they passed through Galilee. And he did not wish anyone to know. For he was teaching his taught ones and said to them, The son of Adam is being delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And having been killed, he shall rise the third day. But they did not understand the word, and they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Kephar Nahum, and being in the house, he asked him, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the way? And they were silent, for on the way they had disputed with one another who was the greatest. Which one of these apostles was the greatest? And sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wishes to be first, he shall be last of all, and servant of all. And he took a little child and set him in their midst, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such receives one of such little children in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives me not but the one who sent me whoever receives me receives me not but the one who sent me that one is capitalized that is elohim father yahweh we miss that point a lot in modern christianity yeshua is awesome and by his atoning sacrifice we can seek the Father and not suffer the wages of our sin, which are death. But there's a, dare I say, a giant hang-up with people caught up in Messiah. And it's not that we're not reverent of. We should be. But the reason that Messiah exists, and you can go look at this in Hebrews 8, 6, 8, 8, 8, 10. It's to lead us back to the Father. It's, it's, he is the mediator of a renewed covenant between us and the Father. But the covenant is between us and the Father. The relationship is between us and the Father. The mediator of that relationship. 
the go-between is Yeshua. We miss that too often today. And John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. And Yeshua said, Do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name is able to readily speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us, and for whoever gives a cup of water to drink in my name, because you are of Messiah, truly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Now hold on. And John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us, casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. Now, first and foremost, there is power in the name. Absolutely there is power in the name. And what are you looking for? Glasses. Okay. No, I want this one. Well, hey. Don't leave your glasses somewhere where you can't find them, okay? Or I'm just gonna go into your wallet and take a few hundred bucks out of it and we'll be even, okay? There's power in the name, is the point here. Go to, it's uh, Matthew 7, let's do it. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Master, Master, shall enter, enter into the reign of the heavens, but he who is doing the desire of my Father in the heavens. Many shall say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? And then I shall declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. I never knew you. Okay. And over here. And Yeshua said, do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name is able to readily speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. I'm being distracted hardcore right now. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you are because you are of Messiah, truly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand makes you stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than having two hands to go into Gehenna, into the pits of hell into the unquenchable fire, where their worms does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot makes you stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than having two feet to be thrown into Gehinnom, the pits of hell, into the unquenchable fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye makes you stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter into the reign of Elohim with one eye than having two eyes to be thrown into the fire of Gehinnom where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, which is Isaiah 66, 24. For everyone shall be seasoned with fire and every offering shall be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if salt becomes tasteless, how shall you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace amongst one another. All right. All of this is in context of telling his apostles, look, if you are doing these things in service to one another in my name, if you're literally figuratively feeding the kingdom in my name, you're not going to lose your reward in me. Okay? Because 
you are of Messiah. Truly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. But if you cause people to stumble who believe in Messiah, it'd be better if a millstone were hung around his neck and thrown into the sea. Remember, these were desert people. They didn't know how to swim. So hanging a millstone around somebody's neck and throwing them into the sea is a death sentence. So if you're stumbling block, the thing that amongst these apostles who are debating over which one of them is the best, whatever that might be, the thing that's causing them to stumble, if it's your hand or if it's your foot or if it's your eye, get rid of it because that stumbling block could lead you into the pathway of hell. For everyone shall be seasoned with fire and every offering shall be seasoned with salt. Quickly, let's go to Leviticus 2, verse 13. Because I'm, you know, it's my doctrinal thesis that the entirety of this book is valid. And Messiah was well acquainted. Remember, there was no New Testament when Yeshua was walking the face of the earth. Everything he taught came out of the Old Testament. And as he told the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes repeatedly, if you knew Moses, you'd know me, but you don't know Moses, so you don't know me. And the problem that he had with them, their legalism was not the law of the Father. It was the laws of man that they had added, the undue burden that they put on the people with their legalistic laws of men, that they had abandoned the Torah of the Father and turned it into this religion of men. And so Yeshua understood this extremely well. In fact, he embodied it. Matthew, what is it, 514? Embodied the Torah, play Ra'u. I came not to fulfill, not to destroy, but to fulfill, to embody it. Play, play Ra'u. Leviticus chapter 2, verse 14. I'm sorry, verse 13. And season with salt every offering of your grain offering. And dot, do not allow the salt of the covenant of your Elohim to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you bring, heart, you bring salt. The salt of the covenant of your Elohim. Do not allow the salt of the covenant of your Elohim to be lacking. Keep a finger there. Flip back over to Mark 9. For everyone shall be seasoned with fire burnt offerings for everyone here in the kingdom and these apostles offering for everyone shall be seasoned with fire and you bring with your offering salt Leviticus 2.13 and every offering shall be seasoned with salt and salt is good but if the salt becomes tasteless what is the salt? it is the salt of the covenant of your Elohim If the covenant with your Elohim goes tasteless, how shall you season it? You have salt in yourselves. Be at peace amongst one another. You have salt in here. Sharpen your brothers up is what he's saying. Don't stumble. None of you is greater than the rest of them. Pluck your eye out. Cut your foot off. Get rid of your hand. The covenant of your Elohim is in here. And if this becomes tasteless, Every one of you, for everyone shall be seasoned with fire, and every offering shall be seasoned with salt. That is the salt of the covenant of your Elohim. Remember that. You are an offering to him. Season your brother. If the salt becomes tasteless, how shall you season it? Have salt in yourselves. Have the covenant of Elohim in yourself. And be at peace amongst one another. We're just going to do nine today. We're not going to get into 10 because it's a long chapter as well. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, these New Testament things that just seem like throwaways, if you don't understand the context, if you don't sit down and read your Bible, there's so much here. I believe when this happened at the beginning of verse nine, that it was during this period late September, early October-ish as we experience it now, the seventh month, Nisan, to them, I believe it's Nisan, Nisan, Hyundai, Toyota, I don't remember which one it is. Um, 
I believe that this was during the period of atonement, right? And that on, as we saw, right, on the 10th day is a day of atonement. Well, we can see here at the beginning of nine, six days, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. On the 15th day is the beginning of Sukkot. And here they are on this mountain making booths. Should we make booths? Because we dwell in booths on Sukkot. Why do we dwell in booths? Because the Father told Moshe that we're going to do this to commemorate the time that we brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim by a strong hand. And it's indicative of the millennial kingdom that we live, that we dwell with the Father and with Messiah here on earth. And who's required to usher that in? The prophet Elijah. And who are the end times witnesses Moses and Elijah and who's up on this mountain with Yeshua Moses and Elijah I mean it's it's all it all lines up and then when they get done with this they come down off the mountain and there's this powerful demon who's been with this person since childbirth and the rest of the apostles can't can't get him out and then we have a reference to prayer and fasting so we have six days dwelling in booths prayer and fasting I believe this is the day of atonement and, uh, or it was the Day of Atonement, and then we went to Sukkot, and then they come down off the mountain, and Yeshua at once again embodies the Torah, walks it out for us, show us how it's supposed to look, and boom, makes that thing go away, because he's Yeshua, and he has all this authority. But it all points back to the keeping of, by our Messiah, and by his apostles, the people who walked with him, they they understood this Torah. They did this Torah. Paul, we just looked at it previously in the last video. But we'll flip there again, because why not? Acts 24, 14. Paul, go to Acts 24, 14. Paul, in defense of himself being accused by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what does he say? And this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the Elohim of my fathers, believing all that has been written in the Torah and the prophets, having an expectation in Elohim, which they themselves also wait for, that there is to be a resurrection of the dead, both of the righteous and the unrighteous. And in this I exercise myself to have a clear conscience towards Elohim and men always. The Apostle Paul that wrote the majority of this New Testament that most people are saying and say to this day because they don't understand Paul at all. And if they claim to, what they understand is the cheat sheet that their, their particular denomination sends out each month that here's what the four services are going to be on this month and here's your references. So put together a sermon out of this. Uh, they all say, well, no, no, no. Paul was absolutely against the law. And this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the Elohim of my fathers, believing all that has been written in the Torah and the prophets, having an expectation in Elohim, which they themselves also wait for, that there is to be a resurrection of the dead, both the righteous and the unrighteous. And in this I exercise myself to have a clear conscience towards Elohim and men always. Paul believed the Torah, the prophets, and the resurrection. And he worshipped the Elohim of his fathers. It's right here in this Bible if we just read it. And then here, what would normally be a throwaway line. We talk about, you know, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Yeah, okay, that's a nice... That's a nice sound bite for modern Christianity. And this salt, well, if the salt becomes tasteless, well, you're the salt of the earth, brother. You're supposed to go out there and season it. Let your light shine. That's not what he's saying. This is the salt of the covenant of Elohim, and we are to be an offering, and we are to be an offering to our brothers and to the kingdom and to sharpen each other up. And if you go tasteless, I'm to season you. That's what this is saying. None of us is better than the rest of us. Man, and if I go tasteless, I'm going to need one of y'all to season me. Right? Sharpen each other up. As one brother sharpens another. As iron sharpens iron, so one brother sharpens another. That's why our ministry is called Grindstone Ministries. Because 
A grindstone weaponizes iron. Why? Because we have battles to fight for the kingdom. We have a creator to serve. We have a messiah to make smile. We have victories to win. And so I'm just constantly amazed by the depth of this book if you just put your nose into it. And so I thank you for being here. Thank you for coming along for the ride. And um, I just can't encourage you guys and girls enough to just put your nose in your Bible, uh, pray over this, and ask the Father to just please speak to you and give you wisdom. And I literally pray that you have a blessed day. Shalom, y'all.